meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. This is the first time we're live on Facebook, and I'm with the man, the myth, the legend, Gus Fernandez. Uh, Gus and I go way back, back, way back. In the days to Poinciana High School, co MVP, uh, co. What were we? Orange Belt Conference champions. OBC, yeah, OBC champions, and way back. Uh, yeah, we go way back, man. Uh, we're talking mid nineties, late nineties, something like that. Uh, and then we've, we've kept and grown our friendship, uh, since then, right. Into different ways of, you know, now we have families and kids and all that stuff, but really good to be a part of the show, man. Uh, I've made a couple of cameo appearances here and there. Uh, you've been on your, on, yeah, I, I've been, I haven't been compensated. For those, <laughs> however, you signed um, the paper though, right? You told me to just sign here. It was a piece of paper. I don't. I forget. I forget what it was. But uh, yeah. So so happy. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy to help in any way. And and uh, nice to see that you're doing really well right now. Well, listen. If this video does well, you may get to earn your one million view plaque from Yugo Pro Baseball. You're not quite there yet. You're not on Nick Shaw level. Uh, but uh, if you keep working hard, you might you might be able to earn that. Well, the, this Nick Shaw you speak of, uh, I believe there's a connection in how he came to the show. So I, just by default, I think I should have received half of that plaque because <laughs> if it weren't for me, Nick Shaw would, be, would not be part of the YouTube family. That is 100%. But regardless, I'm very happy that you guys were able to do that. Uh, and hey, fingers crossed, man. I'll watch this a million times if I have to <laughs> uh, just to get there, just so uh, you know. Well, for those of... Uh, the people who are, might be watching who don't know who you are, who haven't seen your viral appearances, uh, appearances on my YouTube channel, tell us who is Gus Fernandez, where you came from, your baseball journey, and what you're doing now. Yeah, so full name is Gustavo Adolfo Fernandez Colmenares. Uh, hey. I went with Gus because it was a lot easier to pronounce. Uh, quick, straight to the point. Uh, I'm an immigrant. Uh, I came from uh, Venezuela in 1996. Uh, Crazy, because I landed July 4th, 1996, in New York, New Jersey. So I saw, like, as I was landing this American dream sort of thing, I saw, like, fireworks. And, and like, New York City, basically, was my welcoming point to this country. Uh, I lived in Patterson, Jersey, for a few months. Then moved to all the way down to Poinciana, uh, which is where we met. Uh, I was – I loved soccer. My, my dad was a big-time ball player uh in venezuela not professional like at that level but he was a well-recognized softball and baseball player so i was like okay my dad wants me to play baseball but i love soccer and i wanted to play soccer here because i was like oh these gringos don't know how to play soccer so i'm going to come in you know well little did i know first day of uh conditioning right at osceola high school because i went to osceola high school my freshman year first day i know sorry uh very first day, the guy, the coach is like, all right, there's probably 50 kids trying to make a team. He's like, 30 minutes through the woods, go follow the, the, the captain. And I'm like, what? We got to run 30 minutes straight? So my English was not so good looking back then, right? But I knew, what, I knew what running meant, and I knew what 30 minutes meant. So I get in line, right? And like after 10 minutes, I'm like, I, I just can't. I'm not cut out for this. So I made a right into the, like behind one of the trees. That kept, they kept going, and that was the last day I ever played soccer. <laughs> so I was like, well, baseball team is, is looking for players. I was like, I love baseball. Uh, it's probably in my blood somewhere. So I joined the baseball team. Uh, freshman year, we had a really good year. Osceola had a really good baseball team, football team back in those days. I played that year. My family moved from Kissimmee to Poinciana, which is why I ended up moving to Poinciana. Uh, yeah, and I played uh, three years of varsity there. Uh, we connected, I think we connected your uh, sophomore year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, we started playing together. We connected right away. It was us and a couple of other people. Uh, we had a great time. I graduated. I, I ended up going to South Florida Community College. So we played against each other uh, for, I think, a year, you, Troy. Uh, and then after uh, South Florida Community College, uh, I got a scholarship to go play in West Virginia Wesleyan College. Uh, I was there for two years, got my degree. Uh, I thought I was done playing, but I came back home uh, to Orlando, and then my buddy uh, Kenny 
got me a job uh, with Barry Larkin. Barry Larkin had a huge, for those of you who don't know, Barry Larkin is a Hall of Famer now, but he played with, with the Reds for, gosh, probably 17 years, an amazing player. And he built this uh, sports complex facility from scratch. Uh, so I started doing baseball instructions there. John, you also became part of that at some point. Um, I thought I was on plan. And then this coach who was uh, one of our instructors, he was about to manage the Long Island Ducks and the Atlantic League. And he said, hey, uh, you know, you want to come to spring training? He's like, I can't offer you a spot, but I want you to be a part of the team for spring training. Maybe one of the other teams will see you and pick you up. So I was like, yeah. So again, I think this will go into how baseball has a funny way of keeping you involved. So I was like, absolutely. So we went to spring training and uh, at that point it was in Lakeland, Florida. I knew I wasn't going to make the team because at one po at a certain point, the game just becomes too fast for certain people. So I felt like I was out of my league. Uh, but I was like, hey, let me just give this my best. Uh, maybe one of the other teams will pick me up. So uh, I was playing, I mean, guys like Edgardo Alfonso, that Mets superstar, uh, Carl Everett, Pete Rose Jr., et cetera, et cetera. Um, so needless to say, I did not make the team, that team. I get a $50 bill at the end of, uh, you know, at the end of the thing. He's like, thank you. Uh, but then three days later, I get a call from a team in the Frontier League saying, hey, uh, we heard about you. We may have a spot for you, uh, but you need to come up here in the next 24 hours. So I booked a flight. Uh, got up to uh, St. Louis, and then it was a small team outside of St. Louis on the Illinois side. Uh, and I was with them for a few days, and I was taking BP. It was more my level, right? I felt like I could compete. One night, I'm taking batting practice like any other night, and I take a hack, and my left shoulder just pops out of place. And I was like, okay. this." So the, your body keeps telling you, like, hey, maybe, maybe it's time for you to, you know, Go, go in a different route but I'm like no I, I got it right so the coach said hey we'd love to keep you but it's going to take you two three weeks to get back to the field I just can't afford to keep you here so I was shipped back down to Florida uh that was my last day of professional or you know organized baseball if you will was with that team but in my body I felt like I was still young I felt like I had a good arm so I joined a men's league on Sundays and I was like, let me just pitch because I don't want to hit because I'm going to break too many bats and then it's going to be expensive and all that stuff. So um, so one of the games I'm pitching and uh, in my head, I'm like, uh, I'm probably hitting 90, right? Like I felt great. <laughs> However, on the very last pitch, and I'm not making this up, on the very last pitch of a doubleheader, I started game one, 3-2 on the guy. We're up by six runs. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give it all I got. So I cock back and I throw the pitch. As soon as I let the ball go, I just hear like chicken bone snapping, like <laughs> And I drop, drop down and my arm is basically just swinging in the air. Next thing you know, I'm in the hospital. So anyways, fractured my arm. Uh, that is the last day I ever played baseball. Uh, but I'm very thankful for the game. And anyways, long story short, that's kind of my story around baseball. I, uh, I ended up graduating from West Virginia, got a degree in marketing. Uh, I am now, I, for the last really 10 years or so, I've been doing a lot of stuff with sports marketing, entertainment, music, things like that. So Currently, I work for an agency based out of Atlanta uh, that does a lot of that stuff, right? We work with a lot of different brands, and, and we put together campaigns and programs and strategy that, um, depending on, on the goals of that particular company, uh, we adjust and, and, and do things that benefits them. But still involved in sports. I still am a baseball fanatic, as you can see. And, uh, you know, working with you uh, over the last three years or so on your business has been uh, – really insightful to it and a lot of fun. So that's kind of my story there. Yeah. So let's talk about that because you didn't jump right into, uh, you know, working with this marketing agency in Atlanta, you were doing some other work before that, but then we kind of reconnected and, um, I guess we'd never really lost connection, but we kind of reconnected in a business sense and you were like, man, there's some things that we could really do to grow. You go pro baseball. And I was like, let's do it. Whatever you got, let's do it. Because you were always very, uh, business savvy. And I was just a dumb baseball guy. Still am. Well, I say was, but I still am a <laughs> baseball guy who throw vid throws videos up on the internet. But you really came in and helped me a lot strategy wise and business wise from that kind of mindset standpoint. Can you talk about some of the things that you saw coming in and, um, 
you know, moving forward and some of the things that you implemented that really helped grow my business um, in case there's other, cause there's many other baseball coaches and baseball influencers out there just to maybe give them some insight. Yeah. So uh, I think I got to give you props because you were one of the first, if not the first two or three people that jumped on this whole YouTube thing and, and, and said, Hey, I know baseball. I have a lot of things that I can pass on to other people. Typically, you would do that through one-on-one -on -one training, right? Or maybe you would have to record something on a DVD or something like that. But obviously, the internet gave you that tool and that platform. So you were, the, you were one of the first ones to jump on that. Uh, and then, obviously, I've, I've been watching you for, for a while. But then when I said, hey, so everyone always needs an outside perspective, right? Because if you're always tunnel, tunnel focused on your business and the way you do things, a lot of times you get caught up on the way that you want to see things come to life. Sometimes you forget how the consumer or how that player who's 12 years old sees things differently than a player who's 16, 17, right? So I said, okay, now that you've built this amazing following and you have great content and you have a very loyal fan base, how do you start looking at things from a business perspective, right? How do you, even though you've been monetizing your content for a while, how do you start to really leverage the fact that you have the, the, the weekly, sometimes daily attention of all of these people in a very niche segment um, that you know other brands want that same attention, right? A lot of times they have to uh, pay for that in ways, you know, through social paid support, things like that. But what if, what if we started looking at Yugo Pro Baseball as a platform where brands from, you know, small brands to larger brands can say, hey, you're authentic you have an organic following, people trust you. you, not only that, but you play the game to almost the highest level possible, how can we get in business with you? So I think it was a matter of, of connecting those dots and saying to you like, okay, just keep taking care of the baseball side of things, right? Because that's your thing, but I want, to be, I want to be able to help you become a better business owner and a better business person because you have gold in front of you, people want it. How do we make sure that these brands that look for that attention can say, hey, I may have, some, some budget allocated for, for your services. So again, it was about probably nudging you a little bit, uh, helping you open your eyes in, in, in some way and knowing that the world is much bigger outside of the internet than it is, uh, well, let me not confuse people. There's a lot more to do than just putting videos online. There's ways that, you know, to, to make money and, and keep the revenue streaming. Yeah, one of the best things that you helped me implement was uh, making a pitch deck <laughs> and you were like hey man we need to make a deck and i'm like all right what is, <laughs> i don't know what that means backyard a backyard yeah. deck i was like i'll help you build your deck man yeah whatever <laughs> um, and uh so you know um you're like you know you explained to me what it was and then you actually built one out for me and i was like wow this is really cool and then i had someone professionally design it and build it out and it's been amazing now when i reach out to companies or they reach out to me I can just say, hey, you know, check this out. And it gives me a level of credibility and professionalism that normally I wouldn't have otherwise because, you know, it's just me hopping on the phone going, yeah, I make YouTube videos. What do you want to do? You know, instead I can send them this deck, this pitch deck, and it's all laid out in there for them to understand what it is I do, who I uh, my, who my audience is, all my numbers, and if it's going to be a good fit or not. And then we can start to negotiate and talk with these various um, companies and influencers, whether we can work something out or not. So that was something huge. Is that something that everybody needs, like uh, baseball influencers or uh, companies? Because a lot of these companies in baseball are one man shows or, or maybe two or three employees, you know, very, very small. Right. Businesses. Right. That's something every, everybody needs. So I think everyone, everyone needs to see themselves as a brand, right? Regardless of what you do, because a lot of, a lot of your brand has to do or, or how people perceive you or your brand has to do with, with your reputation has to do with how long you've been in the business how, has to do with your pedigree. Right. So a deck, I think for someone like you or people who are watching this, that are in any space. It doesn't have to be just baseball. I think it's just having one hub where all of your information can live in. It is, it's extremely important because uh, like you were saying, it gives you that, that perception of, of professionalism, even though you may not be the biggest influence in the world. The fact that you've put together, uh, you, you've taken resources and you've, you've created this deck that quite honestly, the one I, because we're not designers, right? The one I put for, put together for you is like, hey, if we can make this into a well-branded Yugo Pro deck, 
this is your tool moving forward that is going to keep changing as you grow. It's going to keep changing based on the needs of the brand. So if you're pitching to me and you say, hey, I think I can help you uh, because I have this very uh, niche and engaged audience, um, you know, by the time you send me this deck, there should be a couple of things in there that point to what I what I look for as a brand. So if I'm if I'm brand X Y Z and I make uh, shoes, right, or shoes that are specific for baseball, uh, there should be something in that deck that talks about how you could help me specifically. Uh, some people approach it uh, in a way where they just sent this very generic deck to a hundred people, uh, and then they expect. 10 responses. There's the other belief and route that you can say, Hey, let me pay a little more attention and try to imp not impress them, but get them during that first nibble because they're going to see something in that deck that's going to speak to them specifically. Right? So if it's a bat company, if it's a, a glove company, you, you have to be able to adjust and make sure that it's not catered specifically just for them, but just to let them know that you, you have some thoughts as it relates to, the the space and the industry they're in so i would say not everyone needs to have one but i think if you are if you're considering offering your services to others be it to other businesses on a b2b uh sort of way or if you if you're just trying to get out there and become a bigger brand having a deck is extremely important um you know sending it to a, a designer who's going to charge you 150 to 100 bucks an hour is not necessary there are a number of, of places and, and really resources that are way more affordable, still get a, uh, get the job done. But I think it's not just the content of the deck it's really the context, right? Is, is being able to say, I'm Hugo pro baseball. I'm, I'm, you know, here's basically everything I've done to get to this point And here's how I think I can help you and how I can contribute to you. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's basically what I did when you gave me the outline for the deck. Um, I just went and found someone on Fiverr. Uh, to design it and they made it look beautiful and, and it was awesome. What do you say to the small business owner or the influencer? The, uh, you know, I see a lot of younger influencers coming up too in the baseball industry who are just doing whatever these big brands want. They just, they say, Hey, promote this and they just do it. Or they say, here, we'll give you a free product and just oh. do it. What do you say to those guys and how uh, we need to, possibly, at least in my mind, we need to come together and kind of have some kind of core, uh, you know, yeah, maybe not a system, but just an understanding of, of how this whole thing works. And, and that's difficult, right? Because uh, the internet is available to everyone, right? You don't, you no longer have the need to have a huge production unit of five, six people at a baseball field. Like you need a, you need an iPhone, a tripod, maybe some good audio and you're set. So I think, the best advice that I can give to those coming up is, is yes, definitely think about the community of, of baseball people that, that you probably took inspiration from. And I use that word loosely. Uh, but I want you to, I want you to, you know, I want you to keep in mind as well that uh, you're going to be known for the product and the endorsements you put out there. Right. So when it, when something becomes and feels transactional to you, imagine how that's going to be perceived by those viewers. So, if brand XYZ says, hey, I just need one video or one post, here's 300 bucks, and you're not trying to build a relationship with that company, it's going to come across exactly as that. And the, the reality is it sucks, but I would say 80 to 90% of those that are influencing the baseball community, or players and parents and coaches are doing exactly that, right? They're taking the quick buck without thinking, hey, how can I turn this, this offer of one video into a three offer that will basically give give this relationship more life it will bring more value to the brand and it, it would always it, it will also give my viewership a sense of trust because i'm not just doing one-offs right i'm building something along the way and it creates that feel of authenticity it makes you feel like you're doing something for the long run and if you're trying to actually build something as a brand for your business uh it's just the right thing to do um there are some exceptions where a big brand wants to, you know, they, they want to test with you. Ultimately it's going to be your decision as the influencer, as the content creator. But I would say most, in most cases, uh, most of these brands are have a number set in mind and they obviously based out on CPMs and they look at your numbers, your impressions, the amount of followers. And they say, well, this guy is worth X amount of dollars, right? You always have to find ways to negotiate and make sure that you stick to your guns. Uh, and make the decision that's best for you. But 
you know, if you keep doing one-offs, people are going to see that and they're going to stop, you know, watching your stuff, I think. Yeah. And, and, and you taught me as well to know your value. Like there's definitely value within what you're doing, especially if you have a, an audience and it's not because, you know, I always used to feel like I was selling out or like, you know, I was like money hungry, but that's not it. I'm, I'm providing a very valuable service to connect what I have built to what they need. And as long as it's a good fit and I can do that, you know, knowing in my heart and my mind that it's a good fit and I'm not doing it just because mm-hmm. to make a quick buck, like you were saying, um, that it could be very beneficial, valuable for everyone. And just a few weeks ago, I had a company reach out to me and they were going to offer me a hundred dollars to post a video. And I was, I, I just went through and I was like, look, look at the last 10. I didn't say it like that. I wrote it in a very nice email, uh, delivered a, uh, uh a turd sandwich, if you will. You taught me that one as well. But, uh, you know, I told him, look, look at the last 10 videos I posted, the average number of views on YouTube it gets. If you were to simply advertise on video, your own content, it would cost you over a thousand dollars to reach that number alone, the average views. Plus that's without hiring someone who knows what they're doing to make the ad. Mm-hmm. And without hiring someone to create the content for you, you're getting all three of those in there for, you know, whatever we decide to work together for. Yeah, definitely not a hundred dollars. So you just have to know your numbers, like what you're worth, know your worth, know your value. um, And then, and then present it to them. And if it's, if it makes sense for them, then they're on board. As long as it ties in with your brand and it serves your audience, why not? And, And you know what, if like, if you're reaching out to me and you're saying, Hey, I want to pay you $500. But in my head as the content creator, I'm thinking, okay, a thousand is where I need to be. There's a big gap, right? You also have resources right now online. They can, they can give you kind of uh, allow you to read into what other people have done in those cases. Uh, You may not be able to get to the, to the point that you want at a thousand, but there's room to negotiate, right? For the most part, in most instances, I would also say, that if a thousand dollars is the number you're stuck on, you have to be able to convey, like you were saying, the example was perfect, convey to the brand or the agency that's working on their behalf of why you should be compensated that way. But also another way of looking at it, just like you were saying is they're offering you a 500 for one video and you say, Hey, I can do a three video part, right? Let's call it for 1200, 1300, where now you've given them more value. But as it relates to the people that are watching your videos, it's like, God, this is the second, third video I've seen of John with XYZ brand. They have that, that relationship, believe it or not, helps a lot and helps people understand that you believe in the product, you're you're endorsing it, endorsing it not just because they paid you, because it's a product that you would use with you know yourself, with your kid, your players, etc. Now let me ask you this. What about players, like active players, guys who are in college, guys who are in professional baseball, even some of the younger guys, what do they need to be doing now if they have the aspirations to play for uh, a while or use their marketing and branding to uh, leverage what they have? Man, uh, uh, the platforms available right now for players are just, it's just something obviously we've never seen before. Like in our playing times, when you were, when you, if you said to me, Hey, I can go out and help you. Like if you're my teammate and you can say, Hey, let's go out to the field. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, catch some B roll of you throwing, hitting and this and that. And you can actually yourself, you can, bank the shots, you can edit, then you can help me post. Like think about you being your own agent, right? So if you're a player trying to go from high school to say uh, to college, and let's say you don't believe you can be a D1, but you possibly can be a D2, Juco, whatever the case is, just think of the many outlets, the many ways that you can reach, not just to the coaching staff, to the school, but just to people in the industry, right? That can potentially help you. So if I was a player right now, I said, man, this guy, John, he has a lot of followers. He talks about a lot of baseball. I will DM you a 60 second video of me running a 60 hitting, throwing and say, John, if you find yourself in a place where you can share this with your network, maybe there's a Facebook group that you're a part of that has thousands of people that are now coaching are now, uh, you know what I mean? People that are still in the industry. Like you have to be smart about, about how you go about it, especially in times like today, right? We're living through these, these moments where, Unfortunately, a lot of kids are not going to get the chance to to further their baseball career because of the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, so just get creative. Like, don't be afraid to DM and email people and say, 
uh, just like you, John, there's, there's other people out there that are doing similar things. Like I would send that same 60 second video to five, six, 10 people and say, Hey, please share. And I would not just like, here's a video, but I would actually almost like create a deck for myself that I could say, Hey, here's who I am. Here's my story. Here's, here's what I hit the last three years. Uh, here's where I think I can uh, help a team and then let that take a life of its own. You know what I mean? There are people, believe it or not. And this is something that people never think about. There are a ton of people out there willing to help. And if you approach it the right way, uh, it's likely going to work out for you. In our days, you know, you had to go to baseball camps. Uh, you had to, you know, a guy like you, you were getting scouted, but there's other guys who uh, wanted to get lucky and, and play behind you so they could get seen when you were pitching, right? Or play against someone who was getting scouted and then you have a good day. Like there's a lot needed to come together for you to get, to get a shot. Now uh, that still happens, but I think now you have so many different options to go about it. Uh, yes, you have paid, paid uh, platforms that you could, drop 500, 800 bucks, and they'll put you on this beautiful website with video, blah, blah, blah. But if you can afford that, that's great. Make sure you do your due diligence. But I think there's just other ways that you can also uh, have an impact on the rest of your life. Yeah, not to knock on any of those companies that provide the recruiting services or anything, but I agree with you totally. Like you can do basically what they're doing as long as you're willing to put in the work, you can do it all by yourself. Posting just posting all those stuff, your workouts and stuff like that. Uh, and I say workouts, I mean like on the field and even your workouts in the gym is just an amazing way. Even one video, if one person who has a big following, even without you asking, sees it and thinks it's amazing and shares it, that thing can go viral. Matter of fact, there was a story, a guy at Top B um, who was doing a box jump. He did a box jump, which was crazy insane. It got picked up, it went viral. And a team saw it. he signed a contract because of that one video where he did a box jump. And, you know, they obviously the team ended up looking into him and learning more about him. But it was from that one video that. Yeah, you know, that's crazy, because by me watching a video like that, the, the one thing I'll take away is like, well, he's athletic, right? We know he's an athlete. Can he play baseball? That's to be seen. But isn't that what you always want to look for first? It's like, make sure you get an athlete. And then the baseball stuff, you can always kind of, you know, improve and, and some people are natural but that's a, that's a good example i was also going to say speaking back to that 60 second video that i would make for myself right now if i if i put paid support and i know college, high school kids and but if you only put 50 bucks of support behind that video to run for a week or two and you target specifically the people you think need to see that video right we're talking coaches uh we're talking uh whatever you know executives coaches you can say hey i want people in in this these five zip codes, this 50 mile radius to see my video, that video will not appear on your time, you know, in the, in your feed, if you don't want it to, but it'll target specifically the people that you think should be seeing this video. So if I, if I'm taking BP and I'm dropping bombs, man, that might be an invite to a tryout that you were not expecting just because of a video that someone shot from an iPhone and a, and a $50 investment that that's going to pay off tremendously. That's funny you say that because now the the um, the way you're able to market, you can get it so specific to who you're sending your message to. So that would be huge focusing in on, you know, I wonder if you could even get it to just college coaches. I wonder if you can get it that specific. That would definitely be something to look into. Matter of fact, I think I saw a company a year or two ago who was doing that with Facebook. They were taking the skills video that they, they help you make and they would market it specifically on Facebook to the certain people very specifically. So you're not spending a ton of money, like throwing hundreds and thousands of dollars at it and just normal people are seeing it. Yep. No, very specific people, scouts and coaches are seeing this. I forget the name of the company, but it was a very cool idea. Yeah, I, I, think, I think right now uh, there's no excuse for you to say, hey, I didn't get a shot. I think, you know, yeah, some people are probably dealing with this in a, in a, in a, in a really tough way, what, what we're going through right now. But uh, nothing keeps you from going out to, to an empty baseball field while keeping your distance from others. And like I said, uh, be creative. You know, I think, I think Facebook, that platform is so, so incredibly uh, effective because if you not only can you uh, target, let's say, guy or people that uh, have the baseball coach title, but you can say athletic directors, right? You can say soccer coaches that are likely going to share that with the baseball coach. So, so our, I think our point is, is the same. It's like, get creative, use the resources you have now and, and do 
do not leave it up to others to determine what could happen with your future. Tell me the story about how you met or got Nick Shaw on board. Nick Shaw. So Nick Shaw, so back when we were uh, heavily uh, working together, I think this is 2017, we're just searching for brands that we think we could help in some way, right? So we knew who your audience was. We knew the type of content and your personality. And we said, okay, let's put a list of 20 brands together that we feel are realistic and we feel that can benefit from your, uh, you know, your, your audience. We didn't know, we didn't know what their, uh, you know, yearly revenue was. We just felt like there was a number of brands out there who are probably one, two, three person sort of uh, companies that, that could benefit from this. Right. So the list at that point uh, happened to include uh, the baseball box. So again, back to my, my original point, it wasn't a blank or blanket email that went out to 20 brands of like, hi all, it was very specific with, you know, we found that the owner's name, we found all those things that are, that made it more personal. And we reached out to Nick and said, Hey Nick, we have this channel. Here's, here's a deck. Here's a link. Here's what we, here's a couple of ideas we think we can help you with. Um, you know, let us know. Right. So I think he reached out like almost immediately. I think it was like within hours, right. Very professional. He's like, you know what? Uh, I, I love the idea. He's like, I don't have a ton of money, but I think there's a way for us to work around this, right? Getting creative with it. We said, hey, this guy played in the minors. Like this kid, you know, we looked at some highlights. Like he's a real deal. And he wasn't too far from your hometown or our hometown. But it was a bit of a drive. So from talking to you, I said, John, this is one of those times when you have to forget about money, right? You have to, you have to keep in mind what the, what the value exchange is here. You have your platform, but you also have a guy who can speak about baseball and brings a different perspective. Uh, uh, you know, it's less about pitching and the things that you do is more an infielder hitting fast guy. So he brings a lot of different layers that you're not providing right now. And it, it keeps you from being one dimensional uh, and, and bring in a trusted voice that that's been in the community for some time. So we said, Hey, all right, Nick, totally get it. You can't pay us right now, but what if you came out and shot some videos? We'll then include your brand and we'll plug you in and we'll do some things to make sure that people, and sure enough, I think within a couple of weeks, he made, he made the trip first to uh, Kissimmee, right? Yep. And we shot, I don't know, man, we must have shot like seven, eight videos on day one. The guy drove all the way there. Uh, we were out of the field in the middle of summer for probably, I don't know, eight hours with your production crew. The videos turned out great. They did really well. And then it just kept, right? It kept going back and forth on, I think we made it out to, to his area a couple of times, but the point is that there was value on both sides. It's not always about the money. It, it, it's about relationships and look, look at what's developed over the last two and a half years, right? You guys are not really good friends. You not, you guys uh, are working together outside of YouTube and other uh, ventures. Uh, and, and you guys did over a million views in one video. So it was all because I think he felt that we were trying to be authentic. Uh, we were genuine and then he was also a very cool guy and, and he was good in front of the camera. So I think it all clicked together. Yeah. And I was just telling you before we started the uh, interview here that he's been getting better and better. And he was the first uh, episode of this uh, podcast, whatever you want to call it, Zoom video thing. Uh, by the way, I named it behind the scenes as we once started the podcast many moons ago. So this will be episode two of the new uh, behind the scenes, but man, I own that name, by the way. So you signed the waiver, though. Ah, uh, uh, okay. The waivers. <laughs> I, think I need a better. Everything. I need a better lawyer. I need a better lawyer. <laughs> uh, hey, one quick thing though, before you go away from from Nick, uh, it reminded me because this this was not planned or scripted or rehearsed, but uh, we're both wearing a brand that yeah. it happened in a similar way where we felt there was a good uh, a good fit. Uh, the guy who owns uh, Dig Me Ray. Uh, Navarrete, um, Ray was part of that team uh, with the Long Island Ducks that I mentioned before. So I was in spring training. I met Ray for those 10 days. And I mean, the guy had an amazing career with them, hell of a player. Uh, and he was always uh, into fashion. He started a clothing company. This is his brand. So we reached out to him and said, hey, we think we can help you. He loved the idea. We, I don't think we ever came to a full agreement on, on working together, but he was able to send out some stuff. And look, we're both wearing it. He didn't ask us for it. So I hope he sees this. 
uh, but a really cool guy, re amazing brand. They put out some really good designs. So hopefully you guys can check it out because, uh, you know, he's a really good dude. Well, you know what's crazy about that, and I, I'm sure we talked about this a while ago, but when I was playing in the Mets organization, I believe he used to play with the Mets or he yep. just knew a bunch of dudes in the Mets organization. I think he was with the Mets before he, he went uh, independent. So I had just got there, I guess, right after him, maybe the year after he left or something. So he had still a bunch of friends in the Mets organization, and he already had made the, the brand, and he had a bunch of clothes. But this was like in the very beginning. But he That's would come down and bring boxes of clothes and sell them to all his friends in the Mets organization. And so I'd see guys in the locker room wearing, you know, the Dig Me stuff. I'm like, yo, that's really cool. Where'd you get it? And stuff like that. And they'd be like, oh, Dig Me. So we would, you know, next time he came down, I would throw the guy like, you know, 200 bucks. Hey, go get me some of the good stuff. And they, I always remember like, that was like back in the day before, like they started making like uh, nice material shirts and stuff. He was like one of the first ones to like make some real like, nice yeah. feeling stuff so i was like yeah so i was giving the guy like 200 bucks go buy me as much dig me as you can and then i have my full dig me stuff that i was wearing before even that's awesome i knew that you uh you know knew him and, and reached out to him and stuff like that so i was a fan of dig me before we even so that that talks about the the type of hustle that that he's had forever uh to the point now he's got a well-established brand not just within baseball but it's a brand that's going outside of baseball he's got a couple of brick and mortar uh uh you know, actual places. And I think he's in like Bloomingdale's and things like that. So um, he, uh, like I said, uh, I think he was really well liked. He was a hell of a player and he's done some really amazing things. But I think the biggest thing is uh, that baseball players support each other. Right. So, so you're always going to have that support from, for, especially if you were a good dude to begin with, people will support you. Uh, and then to our previous point of just uh, being able to be creative. Right. And this guy was out there selling to, to, to players and all that. It's just, it's just a really cool thing. And, and not everyone has that in them, the, the hustle spirit, but I think everyone has a layer of creativity they need to explore. You know, what's funny now that you say that I always think about this too. I think baseball players, and it seems like a lot of guys who finish playing baseball end up going to into business for themselves. Not typically, not necessarily in baseball. Like I stayed in baseball, um, but they, they end up doing some type of business for themselves. And I think this is my theory. I don't know why, but I think baseball players are s very good at failing because even the best baseball players in the world are going to fail seven out of 10 times. And you have to have a short memory in baseball. You have to learn how to get over failure quickly. And in business, let me tell you, it's the same exact thing because there's going to be so many hardships and bumps in the road from a business standpoint that I think that's why baseball players like getting into business for themselves and also are usually pretty successful at it because they have that competitiveness as well. Like they want to win. They want to make it happen no matter what. And he's been chugging along and a lot of other guys who have baseball businesses or, or used to be baseball players and now in business are very successful. That's a great point. I think recognizing that, you know, your chances of going all the way, right. Uh, you can base it on stats. You can base it on, uh, whatever you want, but just being able to say years before you're done playing the game is saying, okay, I need to start preparing myself for what that next stage of my life will be. And, and, and you know, in his case, obviously fashion was something he was passionate about, but it's finding that passion early on that you can then, by the time when the day comes, when baseball's no longer around, you can say, you know, I have a pretty good idea of what I want to do. And then even though it's going to take you some time to get there, at least you have some foundation on, on what to build that on. So I think that's, that's really important too. So this was not the typical Yugo Pro video where we're talking about baseball skills and stuff like that. So it might be a little bit different audience, but I still think probably a lot of parents of players might be tuning in to this just because, you know, business relates to uh, everyone and, and it's in, still in the baseball niche and, and it's going to be published on a baseball channel. So I'm sure we've got still some parents here. What do you say as a dad of two young girls who I'm sure are in – many extracurricular activities, what would you, what advice would you give to parents of young children who are, who want to have them have success in whatever sport it is or whatever extracurricular activity it is? What kind of uh, advice do you have from your experience for those people? I, I would say just being great people, being good people is number one, right? Uh, and, and I think that's, that's, I think everyone's born with that 
capability, that skill of just being naturally good to others, but just instilling kindness uh, as young kids, right? Because if, if they don't have that foundation, I think being, being good people uh, as they become adults is going to be very difficult. So, so obviously uh, doing the right thing in front of them, uh, teaching them lessons. And, and what I try to do uh, is finding a teachable moment on a daily basis, right? So obviously that changes from day to day. But for example, my four-year-old wants to ride her bike with no wheels, right? Because her bigger sister is learning now. It's just finding little pockets of time at least once a day, if not once every couple of days that you're able to have that interaction. Uh, that's not just praising her for something great. She did, but just saying, this is why we don't, we don't, we're not going to do what you want is because this could happen. Right? So just finding teachable moments uh, is extremely important. And I think as it relates to sports, uh, it's let them follow their passion, right? As it relates to sports, let them try different things. Uh, you know, uh, they see other friends or, or classmates playing basketball, but you're a baseball guy in your head or a softball dad in your head, let them, because they may find that that's their passion in three years on the road, they may come back to ballet and then jump to softball. So I think as they age out, they'll start to really hone in on what they want to do, but it's just be, be good people, be kind to others. And I think the rest will take care of itself. You know what I mean? That's great advice. I've got a three-year-old son, so I'm always looking for ideas. I always feel like I'm doing it wrong. And then, I, you know, I say my main goal is, like, if I can make sure that he's alive in the morning and, you know. That's a good goal. That's a good – that's, that's my main goal. goal, man. Make sure I, he's fed, he's got a, some great food, and, and I don't hurt him or kill him. Um, that's my main goal. But, you know, I want, I want him to have – and I understand it because I didn't used to – understand it at the depths that I used to meaning before I had my son when I was trained I was training other people's children you know I just said I'm going to give them the information that I have because I right. used to play so I would give it to them but now that I have my own son it's there I have a totally different understanding of what these parents are going through we want the best for our children and yeah you know, it's a struggle. Like there's no book, there's no book on how to do it. And a uh, funny thing, my dad, you know, my, you know, my dad. And when I had my son, I said, dad, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Like, tell me, give me some tips on how to, how to raise my son. And he goes, listen, he looked at me real serious. He said, listen, when you get a job as a bus boy at a restaurant, they're going to teach you everything you need to know about how to clean those tables, everything you need to know. They'll train you for weeks. He goes, when you have a baby, they wrap them in a blanket, smack them on the ass. <laughs> say, good luck. He goes, they don't tell you anything. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. That's goes, crazy. He goes, you got to figure the rest of it out. <laughs> you know, what? one thing that I meant to mention too is, is uh, alongside those teachable moments is stealing confidence, right, in them. Because just like baseball players, I think as we, as we start to grow up and, and become young adults into adulthood, we're going to fail a lot in, in a lot of different ways, right? Uh, we're going to fail at school. We're going to fail at sports. We're going to fail at maybe disappointing your parents because you didn't clean your room, whatever the case is. We're just making sure that, that we, we find that balance between teaching and, and keeping that confidence level up because the last thing you need is a, uh, a, a kid that grows into adulthood with very little confidence. And then they're out in the real world trying to gain confidence that, uh, that it's going to be really difficult to, to achieve. Right. So is, is, is that, that, I think that sweet spot of uh, teaching the right things, being kind and also instilling confidence. So when they grow up, they're going to still have to make their own decisions. Right. Uh, but at least you know that you, as a parent, you've done everything you could have done to prepare them for those moments. That's great. That's great advice. And, and that kind of ties into what you said before, where you just like let them find their own passion and kind of help steer them towards it. And if they find that, instead of you trying to make them do this and make them do that, I feel, I don't know, again, my son's only three, but I feel like that would build more confidence quickly because they're doing something that they like, you know, and they're going to have fun with it. And I think you, and I want to hear your thoughts on this because I don't have a son, but you know, my daughters might end up playing softball, right? Or whatever they want to, uh, to me is, is I, I want them to play sports because I think that's just such a good thing, such a cool thing for, for kids. But I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on some parents, especially dads who want to live vicariously through their kids, right? So let's say these dads that couldn't play up to a certain level, couldn't reach their potential in baseball, Maybe they were cut from their high school team, but they thought, they were, you know what I mean? But now they want to put all of that unneeded pressure on their kids to succeed in the baseball field because of those 
challenges or failures they had as, as young adults? Listen, that's a great question. I used to think that these guys were crazy. I'd be like, these dads are crazy. Why are they doing this? But now I get it. And now I understand that having a son, I totally get it. Cause there's sometimes I'll let my mind drift and I'm like, man, I can't wait till, you know, I start training him when he gets a little older and he's going to, I'm going to do all this and he's going to make it to the uh, major leagues. And I'm like, wait, hold on. He's three years old. He can't even ride a bike yet. (laughs) You know, I got to come back and be like, whoa, chill out. You know, so I can totally understand how it gets to that point. Um, Especially if the kid likes baseball, um, you know, and then the dad gets gets more involved and more involved. The next thing you know, it's just, absolutely not especially if they're good right like if the kid keeps getting better then you're like let me keep pushing and pushing and pushing but i think i think there's a balance too right i think yeah i think the kids feel that pressure and i think if if they go all for three in a game and and that's pissed off and upset about that like there's ways so i think you can still uh expect certain things as they get older uh but the unwanted pressure or unneeded pressure i think could be very difficult i didn't have that growing up my dad was very much like uh, you know, just, just make sure you prepare for the games, eat well, have fun. That's number one. But that wasn't like stand behind home plate and, you know, yell uh, every time you swung a bat or you threw a ball, you know? So that's, yeah. you got to be careful with that. Yeah, that's good. My it's same, same with me. Luckily my dad was not a baseball guy. So he, you know, he just didn't, didn't really have any advice to offer. So that was good. But he always <laughs> led, by, led by example, as far as like working out and stuff. I, I got involved in working out because he was always working out. Like he went to the gym always every day after work. And, and everyone wants to be like their dad. I think if you got a good yeah, dad, of course, yeah. like your dad, you know? Yeah. Um, so I was like, I wanted to go to the gym. So I started going to the gym when I was like 13 year old, 13 years old. He bought me a weight bench for my room when I was like 12 years old. And, you know, he showed me how to do it. It it was never mandatory. I never had to do it, Right. but he was, he would always ask, Hey, I'm going to the gym. You want to go? And if I wanted to go, I would go. And a lot of, I had a membership to the gym since I was 13 years old. So, uh, that was, that was something that was, you know, really beneficial to me, but he never made it like, we have to do this. We never, right, right. Like, hey, we have to go to the field. Hey, but if we, you know, he would say, hey, you want to go out to the wall and throw the ball? We used to play a game called errors where you would throw the ball and then the other person had a field and if you missed it, yeah. point, and you know, after so many, you would be out. So it was always fun. There was no, no reason you had to get out there and practice. So. I think, I think the, when you look at the spectrum of those parents and you have the, the on one side, you have like, I don't even, I didn't even know my kid played baseball to, to got, you know, parents who, Oh, my, my kid can't play shortstop. I'm just going to take him out and create another team. Right. right. And then, it, so I think there's two different extremes that, that I think that balance, there's a lot of room for balance and you can be, you know, you can have a really tough work schedule that doesn't allow you to be there and all that. But at least if you can find some time to be somewhere in the middle, um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a good thing. Obviously, as kids get better, they keep growing. You see more potential. There, there are ways to, to, in you know, increase that amount of attention. But I think it's when it gets really uh, full of pressure, where the kids feels and they start uh, doing other things outside of baseball just to, uh, you know, express themselves. It's when it becomes really dangerous. I think. Yeah, that's tough. And you can't really, I can't really fault that dad much because, I mean really he wants his kid to have success I you know I believe that's a thought it just went a little overboard over the over the years so I think Mm -hmm. as as parents we just need like you said have that balance and and kind of have that self-awareness to know like where this is going like even myself at three years old I'm already thinking oh man I wonder what MLB team he's going to be playing for and I'm like no I don't even know like that's okay man that that's okay I think that's part of that's part of the process right uh, and, and, you know, I think it, it's going to be ultimately up to the parent and, and the kid and, and the mom, obviously the parents to figure out the best way to raise their kids. But I just think as a, as a rule of thumb, uh, let them enjoy the sport and, and, you know, they're going to be, I think their destiny, not that their destiny is already written, but do what you can to help them without actually taking away from the game. That's great. Gus, where can, if there's baseball companies out there, listening uh where can they reach out to you maybe uh if they have any questions if there's baseball companies or anyone out there they should reach out to you at you go pro baseball because that's the best play to base place to go for anything baseball related and then you'll get a hold of me otherwise uh you know you can reach me at gus.fernandez at me.com 
Uh, but go to John first, and then if it if it makes sense, we'll get together and we'll help you. I don't think we're looking uh, we're, we're looking to help people in any way possible, right? Uh, especially right, right now, people thinking, what should I do? There's there there aren't a whole lot of people buying my products online. Should I be making more content now that people are watching more? Uh, we'll we'll keep pumping out some content. You know, I'm happy to join you whenever you want to have me. But uh, reach out to John first, and then he'll get a hold of me. We'll go from there. Thank you so much, Gus. Thanks for having me, brother. On and uh, let's talk soon. I love you. Have 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 a good one and take care of yourself. I love you too.